In this video, I'm going to continue working on a set I recently showed in a Friday Night Restoration, which is a Motorola VT71. In that video, I got it working electrically. Now I want to finish it off by doing some work on the cabinet, attempting an alignment, and explore some alternatives to the ballast. So first thing I want to do is use some Gojo to clean up the wood. I imagine there's some dirt and old wax built up on it. Also, I'm going to pop these caps off, take out the screws. I'm going to remove this lower trim, get the plastic faceplate off, and clean that up with some Novus Number no. 2. It's got some scratches in it, and there's some funkiness. It's probably just dirt on the inside. We shall see. And uh, once I get it cleaned up, I imagine I'll put some latex paint splatters. I'll try to get off with some steel wool. There's some sticker residue here from the auction where I got this. Well, there's a sticker on here. And uh, then we'll see uh, about maybe uh, doing something with these scratches. Maybe some Howard's Restore finish. I don't know. I, but I do know I definitely do not want to refinish this. It's in far too good a condition for that. The cabinet's coming along even better than I had hoped for. I just finished wiping down this side with Gojo. You can see it's quite dirty. And then I'll use some naphtha to re remove any remaining residue. And then some Howard's Feed and Wax to protect it. I finished cleaning and waxing the cabinet. I also popped off the logo and gave it a fresh coat of gold paint and uh, dug up some knobs and I slid the chassis back in because I wanted to make sure that the CRT inside the cabinet was actually good and that the speaker's good and they both are so uh, next time I pop the chassis back out and attempt an alignment I dug up some instructions and they're uh, a little bit different from sets I've uh, aligned in the past but I'll see what I can do Before I can do an alignment, I need to find some decent instructions. I noticed on the Early Television Foundation website they have scanned the VT71 info from Riders Volume 1, but that only covers the earliest revisions of this chassis, whereas I have the last revision. It turns out that they cover every revision in great detail in Volume 2, so hopefully one day those guys will get around to scanning volume two, but uh, I actually have a hard copy. Now this is in the crazy earlier form factor for the riders. Later ones were much larger books. Uh, so what they did in these in the early uh, eight and a half by eleven version to cram all the info in here is they have a lot of fold out pages. Pretty much every schematic is uh, a fold out page which makes this thing really thick and bulky and awkward to use. <laughs> you can see these pages come out and then they fold out. They both fold out this way and this way so you get huge sheets. Now, keep digging through here. Eventually, I will get to the PT-71. Starts out this right here. And you see this covers the four B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and J, which is what I have. Now there's a ton of info. It's incredibly in depth. Basically this. <laughs> All that just on this set. Well, let's see that I've got the National uh, TV 7M, which is cool because I've got one right over there. Alright, so I actually already have flipped through this and they've got a lot of great info about the theory of operation and service tips and suggestions on, uh, on servicing these, but what they don't have actually is very good alignment info. 
I mean, they do outline the procedure here, but they don't actually show like response curves or markers like I'm accustomed to. It's just all sort of text. Um, so uh, I'm going to pull out the SAMs and see if that's any better. I'll tell you, I mean, if you <laughs> if you want to know more about these sets, get your hands on this because uh, I, it's just everything in here, very detailed. Even the, the parts list here, every screw, uh, nut, bolt, everything, and the parts diagrams are awesome. In the Sam's photo fact, they typically take a photograph of the other side of the chassis and they'll have pointers to it. Whereas this. Well, it almost looks like an artist's rendering of this thing. Very, very cool and very detailed. Let's see, this is the early style where the high voltage caps were located, scattered around the chassis because they were too big to fit all in over here. This is a big can of oil filled high voltage caps. Here's the fold-out schematic for the 4J. I think they went a little overkill on this because there's plenty of empty space on this page. But uh, so it is nice. Now, as nice as this is, imagine how inconvenient it is to have this huge book up on your workbench with this big fold-out. So uh, not the most practical thing. The alignment instructions from the SAMS photo fact were more like what I'm accustomed to. They have it all here in these grids and they show you what the patterns you should see on your scope. For the first part we don't need a scope. Just a signal generator and a VTVM and that is doing the audio. So I've got my Sencore VA62 set up for 4.5 MHz audio IF. VTVM hooked up. Signals injected in the appropriate place with VTVM pickoff as indicated. Now, the first thing I want to do is peak a certain coil. Oh, and by the way, I am doing this with the CRT uh, with my uh, filament simulator here. They actually say in the alignment instructions to just jump this out, but I don't want to overload the tube filament, so I put a resistor in there. Alright, so this is the first coil, and this should be peaked for 4.5 megahertz. Got my VTV VM on the lowest scale, using the smallest possible signal input to get a decent meter deflection. Let's tweak the coil, that's going the wrong way, the other way. Whoa, that was way off. I've uh, also double checked this to make sure it's accurate with my scope. 4.5 megahertz and yeah it's it's dead on. Um, so I'll drop the level down on this some more, get the meter back on scale. So the, the idea when you do an alignment is you always want to use as low an input signal level as possible. If your meter pegs, instead of going to a higher range on your meter, drop down your signal level out of your generator. Uh, I keep tweaking this. So that could certainly explain the poor audio performance. Wow, that was way, way, way off. Drop this down to the lowest signal level. Mm, maybe too low. These VA62s don't have the greatest attenuator output. They're low, medium, high in the potentiometer, and the overlap of the scales isn't so hot. Alright. That'll work out. Right about there. In other words, I'm on the medium level, and this is completely counterclockwise, as low as it'll go. Now, if I drop down to the low, oh, and see what the meter is right about here. If I drop down to low and go all the way up, I'm only here. In other words, there's about this much of signal level that I can't get out of this generator, sort of a blank spot. 
I would like to think the low, medium, high would overlap each other, but instead they actually have a gap between each other. Uh, anyways, so that's that. Now, I also need to peek a 2, which is the top of this metal can, which is a ratio detector. So you peek this one for 4.5, and then the bottom also has a slug, and that's the one, uh, that's on the ratio detector, so that's the one you want to null and have at 4.5 megahertz you want to have a zero output on your meter and if the frequency goes slightly lower or slightly higher it should swing positive and negative equally around that null point alright so let's see if this coil is also off yes it is alright I'm going to go back and touch up the other one good idea to go back and forth as you tweak these So, I, between the two of those, geez, I probably like doubled the gain or more. The ratio detector was off a bit too, so tweak that. Now I've moved on to video. That's where things are a little different than I've done in the past. In that uh, it's mostly done visually on all those admirals with a stagger tuned IF what I would do is use a fixed frequency RF generator and a VTVM and peak various coils this time we're going to be doing it all with a sleep generator and on a scope doing it visually so uh, there's the current overall IF response not quite what we're looking for so I will start going through these steps Right now I've got it set on 25 megahertz for the marker. That's the blip right there. And here's 20 and here's 30. So I am supposed to adjust A4 and A5 for maximum amplitude at that marker. And then here's where I do it uh, again all visually. 27 and 21, or rather 22.1. You're supposed to adjust coils kind of back and forth so that it ends up looking like that. Where 21.1 and 27 are 50% down at the outer edge, and you want to make that top as flat as possible. I was able to tweak the IF response to get it looking more like this shown in the diagram, but that wasn't the main cause of problems with this set. Now that helped, and tweaking the, uh, the sound IF coil certainly helped a lot, a much better sound now. But the main reason the picture looks so bad is that these were not adjusted right. These are various slugs for the 8 position channel selector. That's what these are. So this is the first position, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. There are 13 channels this set's capable of receiving, or I should say 12, 2 through 13. Um, but by FCC rule, you couldn't have two adjacent channels in the same city, so you wouldn't have channels 2 and 3 and 4 in the same city. You might have 2 and 4 or 3 and 5. And so on and when you would go and buy this set from your dealer they would already be configured for your area well I noticed there were some handwritten numbers on here like three and eight which led me to believe that somebody was fooling around with these and sure enough by tweaking these oscillator slugs and then these are only for the first four channels and same with these I guess the higher frequency channels didn't need them but these are for tweaking the RF amp, I guess the bandpass response of that and these uh, are antenna trimmers so by adjusting for example the first position which I'm using right now which is channel 3 I tweaked this, this, and this and it made a big difference so that's it as far as the electrical restoration goes on this set. I'm really happy with the way it's playing. 
Now, I had mentioned about a retrace suppression modification, and I think I'll go and give that a try, but notice there are no retrace lines now. They will only reappear if I turn the brightness up. You can see one of those diagonal lines there. And then I'll uh, explore options for the ballast. Now, it turns out I actually did show this retrace suppression modification in an earlier video. So one, uh, I think it was a three-parter where I reassembled a blonde VT71 that had already been re re uh, electrically restored. I just hadn't finished it off and put it in the cabinet. But I'll go over it briefly again. Here are some photos from when I did that retrace suppression earlier. So there's the circuit. That's the 6SL7 vertical output tube. Normally, this 250 picofarad cap off of pin 5 just goes to ground. What you do is you cut that ground connection and add in 47K and tie that to pin 3 on the 7JP4 which is where the brightness control goes. Now when I did that I had trouble with some streaks appearing in the picture. When I looked at it on a scope I saw that I was getting the occasional positive transients. See what you're doing here is you're picking off the signal uh, for the vertical and with a little RC filter here it makes it into a negative going pulse. That's what these are. And you want that negative pulse on pin 3, which is on the control grid, and that will blank out the picture. These positive blips have the opposite effect, they make a bright streak on it. So that's why I added the diode, to act as a clamper. I used a 4007, but I think a Schottky diode would be more appropriate. Faster response time. And once I added that diode, I got something like this and here's those blanking pulses without any of this positive going noise. So that's a modification that I will make. Now as for the ballast, that's what they show here in this diagram. It's essentially four resistors mounted on an octal base. Well what I've done is taken this and simplified it. In particular, I took all the series wired tube filaments and added up the tube filament voltages for you. So one thing right away you should note is that at least in the TS4J late, and I think most of the other revisions as well, they are not equal. So in other words, a bunch of tubes are wired in series and then a bunch more wired in series separately. There are too many tubes to wire them all in one series string, but there aren't quite enough such that you could have two series strings that equal 117 volts. That's where the ballast resistors come into play. Now the ballast they use, both ballast resistors um, are the same value, which is not right. If you really want to have the right current going through these tubes, which is 0.3 amps, 105 isn't going to cut it. So what I did here is assuming we got 117 here, I took these two filaments and uh, subtracted that and we get 41.6 volts we need to get rid of on this one, 35.3 over here. If we do the math, 0.3 amps, 41.6 volts, it's about 140 ohms and 118 on the other side. So if you were going to replace this ballast with power resistors, I suggest you use the closest you can get to 140, 139 I think is the standard value, and 118, and at least 15 watts. Now as for the other two, a 37 and a 200. The 37 I'm pretty sure is just there to cut down on the surge current when you turn the set on so you wouldn't burn out the old selenium rectifiers. When using modern silicon diodes, I don't think you need this at all. However, if you leave it out, you will be increasing the voltage a little bit into the set. 
I don't think it'll make that much difference, so I'm inclined to leave it out and save one part and save a few watts of heat. This guy, though, you really do need because it does drop quite a bit of voltage across it. And this is just for the power supply filtering. So this, these two caps, these two rectifiers, that's your voltage doubler off the AC line. And then this RC forms a low-pass filter to filter out the ripple. So we know it should be about 200 ohms, but what about the wattage rating? Well, two things I could do. One is I could go over to my set, turn it on, hook up a voltmeter and see how much voltage is being dropped across it. However, while perusing the service info, I saw a note somewhere mentioning the typical voltage drop across this resistor. However, I didn't write it down, so I'm going to go dig right now and see if I can pull that, fit, that uh, value up. I found the section in the rider's info that mentioned that voltage drop, and it comes out to be about 23 volts. And also, I had to make a correction about what I said earlier. It turns out that Rider's Volume 1 does have all the background theory on the VT71 operation. So what I think they did is that in Volume 2, I think they just copied this whole section verbatim from Volume 1 and then tacked on the production changes and extra schematics for the later chassis revisions. Alright, so since we know that this drop now is about 23 volts, that works out to uh, about 115 milliamps of load, or less than 3 watts of dissipation, I rounded it up to 5. And likewise, it'll be about 115 milliamps flowing through this guy, which is less than a watt, so let's just call that a 1 watt resistor. So if you just want to place these with just straight up resistors, 140, 118, 37, and 20, 15 watt, 15 watt, 1 watt, and 5 watt. I really had to probably go with 20, maybe 25 on these guys because they will get toasty. And then to assemble it, salvage an old octal socket maybe out of a burned out tube. And so that's to say, these, these guys will get really hot. So I try to assemble it such that um, the, the heat has somewhere to go. So, is there any other way to do this? In particular, is there any way to do this that won't dissipate quite so much heat? Well, there's two other techniques I've mentioned in the past for other projects where I've had series dropping resistors. One is to use a diode, or possibly a diode and resistor in series, and the other is to use a capacitor. The diode solution you can only use if this voltage you're trying to drop is within a certain range. And I'll have to pull out my little calculator spreadsheet to see if it's even possible. Capacitor absolutely is possible. I've already crunched the numbers and I can tell you that between about 8.2 and 10 microfarads is what you want. Unfortunately standard capacitor values are really only available in 8.2 or 10. The exact numbers I'll show you in a moment. It'd be nice to use a slightly different value for each of these. I already ordered some up a while ago. I'm going to go with 8.2. We'll see how that works out. There is some sort of balancing effect between the filament load and the capacitor, so it's, I don't think uh, it'll be too much of a concern. And the way those work is that to AC, a capacitor actually looks like a resistor. That's the, the term reactance you may have heard before. So the, the capacitor will actually form a bit of a phase difference and kind of fight the flow of electricity going down to this resistive load. And they dissipate no heat. One thing to keep in mind though is that because there is going to be AC current flowing through those capacitors, you should really use caps that are rated to have a uh, significant current going through them like a, like an AC motor run capacitor. However, those are pretty big so what guys typically do is just use your standard uh, DC rated capacitor like a 250 or, or better rated DC film capacitor. Seem to work okay especially if you're just going to run the set periodically. Just wanted to point that out that if you're going to use it for continuous AC load operation. You really need to get an AC rated capacitor. 
Here's a spreadsheet I found online a while ago. It's very handy for doing stuff like this. So let's start plugging in some numbers. 17, 60 hertz. Let's do the first heater string, which is 75.4. And we get 0.3 amps. And I'll leave that at 10 for now. So yes, indeed, you can use a diode. So just as I'd said, about 139 or 140 at, I said 15 watts or better, that's where I got those values from, if you just want to use a pure resistor, or a resistor with diode, 24 ohms rated at 2.2 watts or better for resistor and diode in series, or you can use about a 10 microfarad capacitor with a surge limiter resistor. Now, uh, if you want, you can forget about the surge altogether, drop this down to zero, and then you got closer at 8.2 I was talking about, no resistor at all. However, if you do that, you're not going to get much protection when you turn the set on and those tube filaments are cold. However, instead of using a 33 ohm 3 watt resistor I would suggest using something like a CL90 surge suppressing thermistor instead now let's see what about that other filament string so there we get the 118 I would shown earlier or if you use a diode, you're almost dead on with just the diode. All you need to do is just a little 3 ohm resistor. I'd be inclined to just maybe even leave that out. And for the cap, well, it actually should be about 11 microfarad. But again, if we take this out, then we're a bit under 10 microfarad. So I chose 8.2. Now one thing that'll do is it'll actually starve this thing of current a little bit more. You can do that kind of by simulating that. So, two, six. so instead of 0.3 amps, it'll be more like 0.26 amps. However, keep in mind, I don't have 117 volts in my outlet. Few people do. I just put that in because that's what the set's originally designed for with my variac. I can get 117. I've actually got about 125. And now I notice the, the capacitor dropped down to 7.3. Well, let's get this back up to 0 0.3 amps. And hey, look at that. It's about 8.2. That's why I went with 8.2. So I figured I could run this set directly off the outlet, not worry about running out of variac to reduce the line voltage, and everything should be happy. So I want to try out uh, two techniques, the diode with the resist, small resistor in series and the capacitor. I think either one of them are perfectly valid solutions. And as far as the uh, surge limiting, what I would do is just throw a CL90 in right here. Instead of adding a separate one for each filament chain, and putting it inside so you're so you're gonna make your your ballast in an octal socket maybe with a metal tube and stick the parts inside you could stick a couple seal 90s inside there one for each filament string but why not just stick it like right on the AC line and not put it in the ballast at all that way it'll surge suppress the entire set the filament strings the rectifiers everything they're rated for about two amps continuous this set only draws uh, less than an amp or you know about an amp so that should be fine So here's my proposed design using diodes. So you got CL90, thermistor, 47 ohm at 5 watt or better, and a 1N4007 diode, 22 ohm at 2 watt or better, and another diode. And I took out that 37 ohm entirely, and then we got 200 ohm at 5 watt or better. And here's the capacitor version again, CL90. And these are those surge limiting resistors that I think are unnecessary if you use a 
CL90 out here. And then 8.2 microfarad non-polarized plastic film capacitor. And again, a 200 ohm or 5 watt or better. One of my Motorola sets came with the remains of a ballast, which I imagine looked like this originally, but when I got it, the metal can was completely gone. Just had the remains of the mica nichrome wire and the base. So I clipped this off the base and used it as a platform to build up my substitutes. So this is the first, or rather this is the uh, capacitor design. So it's this guy. I left out the 33 ohm resistors, especially after reading the results of experiments by some other guys on Video Karma that have been experimenting with the very same thing, and they said that these capacitors allow for a very slow, controlled startup, which makes me think that maybe the CL90 really isn't necessary either. There was also some agreement about leaving out the uh, 37 ohm resistor, however, I went ahead and I put one in, I went with 33 ohms, I figured that plus the CL90 in there is about 37 when it reaches operational temperature, and there's the 200 ohm resistor, and there's the two big old capacitors, so let's give this a try. For 125. I remember I uh, want to, uh, instead of running it at 117, I want to simulate what it's like if I plugged it right into an outlet. And here it goes. Let's turn the lights off when I do this. There's two ways to judge film and startup time. One is to use like an ammeter and watch that, or just watch the tube film as the light up. Well, that's a pretty significant difference so far because I can't see anything glowing. There we go. It's just starting to come up. <laughs> okay, well, that is certainly a very slow start of time. Hard to say too much, uh, which is from the CL90 and which is from the capacitor, but that's sure a very nice, gentle startup. No surge current there. don't look as bright as they were with the regular ballast. I'll pop that back in a moment to verify that. So I'm probably starving instead of a bit of current. Probably between the CL90 and, uh, and the caps it might be just a little too much. Well, that's pretty good reception. I'm just using a random chunk of wire. Bad at all. Oh, well, that really did help out. I didn't even tweak the oscillator for this. It's channel 6. I don't know, so it seems to work fine, so even if I am starving it of current, like I mentioned earlier, heck, that would just prolong the life of the tubes. That's no problem. The question is. Is anything overheating? So that's getting pretty toasty. But it is a uh, five watt resistor, vitreous enamel. So I think that can take it. This guy's rated for two amps, so even though it's quite toasty, um, I'm sure that's fine because there's no way there's anywhere near that much. In fact, I know the whole set draws less than an amp, so that's not a problem. And then there's a 33. Oh, um, I only went with a watt. That's getting kind of toasty. If I was going to leave that in there, I'd go with at least two watts on that. But, uh, oh, it seems to work fine. So there's definitely one possible way to go with this. Whether or not you need the CL90, I don't know. You can see it takes a set a lot longer to start up. But other than that, Okay, 
And now there's this design. Now right away I can tell one thing I'm not going to like about this is that, yes, it will be a lot smaller because you don't need these big capacitors. Instead you'll have these minuscule diodes, but you need to add in these two resistors and the other resistors in the CL90 would stay unchanged so it's definitely going to dissipate a lot more heat. Um, these, I bumped, I rounded these wattage ratings up a bit, but figure it's going to draw at least three or four watts extra than this design. Um, but it'll be more compact, so I don't know, flip a coin. Whichever. I also wanted to mention that there is another option out there. There are some outfits, or at least one, I think, tubes and more. I'm not sure, but they sell new old stock. Motorola ballast, that's where I got this guy from. However, well, what's in here is this. It's a metal tube, but look how much bigger it is. Inside of it, instead of the mica wafer and exposed nichrome, it has, might be a little hard to see, but some big long loops of what uh, look to be like uh, fiberglass coated wires. I imagine that's another type of resistance wire but these actually have some insulation on them. And actually in one of my sets, I don't remember which one, but it came with one of these installed in it. And I think this is the, uh, oh, it's a 303 as well. So I'm not sure if Amperite ever made a glass 303. I've never seen one. This is the only uh, alternate type of 303 ballast I've seen. It's made by Clarastat that are huge. So, uh, <laughs> there's one definite problem with these. When you put them in the sets, because they're so tall, they get very close to the top of the cabinet. Very little clearance right up near that piece of asbestos. And these do get quite hot, so I'm not crazy about them. I'm really, I would really prefer to avoid using them if at all possible. Alright, well, just to finish things off, I'll go ahead and build the uh, diode version just to see how it performs. I just had a little rude reminder of a comment that I saw online about using this technique which was to put a high value resistor in parallel with these big caps like 100k or so to bleed off the charge when you turn the set off because I got a nice little spark. Luckily I didn't get shocked. It just surprised me a bit as I was unsoldering them to put the diodes in. I wouldn't be surprised if there's still a bit of charge left. There's a little little snap there. Let's see on the other one. Yep, <laughs> charge left in that guy too. So be careful when you're working with these. Alright, here is the diode version. There are the two diodes, and there's the resistors in series with them. The 22 ohm is a bit oversized. Uh, I only spec'd out a 2 watt, but I had a couple 5 watt resistors of the same design, so that's what I went with. Alright, so will it work? Well, I'm pretty sure it'll work, but how well will it work? Notice I unplugged this up before I did that because. One of those leads goes to the AC line. As is so common with these sets, they put the switch going to ground. So when this set's plugged in the wall, you've got live AC going to one of those pins on that ballast. Something to keep in mind. Alright. Put the PR57 on. Before I'll turn the lights off. And here we go. Again, a slow startup, but not quite as slow. So I'm sure it's just from the CL90. I think the tubes might be just slightly brighter, but not much. That might just be my imagination.
And this side still works just fine. Man, it's still 78 degrees. It's like 2.30 in the morning right now. <laughs> in the midst of a heat wave. Yeah, let that run for a little while and see how hot those resistors get. And then the last thing I'll do is I'll put the original ballast back in and try to do a visual comparison of how uh, bright the filaments are. It gets pretty toasty, just like I calculated it would. 47 ohm, about twice as hot as a 22, which makes sense. And, uh, well, you know, everything except the diodes dissipates heat, but it is smaller than with those capacitors, so there's, there's my two options for you. A bit more compact and less expensive, but it runs hotter, or cooler, but a little more expensive and bulkier. Well, I said I wanted to go original, so I'll go all the way back to the one that was in this set when I got it. Tubes light up a lot faster. And, uh... Yeah, they are brighter. A little bit. A little bit. Which is also what I figure. So, which am I going to go with? Uh, I'd be inclined to go with the capacitor. With the addition of uh, a bleeder resistor across them. <laughs> Shock myself on one of those. I did a little more research online about that retrace blanking modification and I think I may have gotten it wrong when I first did this a few years ago in another set. Either that or the source I got had a different explanation of how to do it because instead of a 47k, it should really be a 220k. And then maybe with that I wouldn't have needed that diode. Or maybe the 220K didn't work and I, I, I went to a 47K. Honestly, it's been a little too long. I don't quite remember. Although I do have a video on it. So I think a three-parter when I uh, did a blonde set. But regardless, the history of where this modification came from is actually from the last generation of the Motorola electrostatic sets. The Motorola 9T1 that uses a very similar TS-18A chassis, and in that, they have the retrace blanking in there. They use a 220K, and they have it tied to pin 3, so pin 3 normally in the older sets goes to ground. So what you do is you cut the ground connection, and you take this capacitor that's already in the circuit, which is going to ground, and you cut that connection, that 220K resistor, and tie pin 3 to that junction. Alright, so where's all that stuff in the set? Well, Look on the socket, and pin 3 is the orange wire. Easy enough to pick off, nice and bright. Goes through a hole in the chassis, and around and around, and it comes out here. So this wire right here, going to this junction, which is ground, so you need to unsolder that, or cut that wire out of there. And you need to route it over to here. This is that 250 picofarad cap. So this junction is also ground, so you need to lift up this connection, at a 220k resistor between this wire and that point and that's where you tie in that orange wire. Now I'm gonna guess there's, that there's no spare lug anywhere that I could use for that 220k resistor so uh, for now I'll just leave it kind of floating in there yeah it seems to have done the trick some guys reported having problems with vertical stability after installing that modification. I don't think I've got that issue. Sorry now the brightness has turned up just about all the way. Now it is up all the way. 
with some more normal level down here. So yeah, I can adjust the brightness and contrast throughout their entire range now and no retrace lines. I just do adjust the brightness by the way. I often have to readjust the focus. Just, um, Here's one last look at the chassis before I put it back in the cabinet. I'm just simply replacing the cardboard covers over the cut down capacitors rather than bothering to try to reattach the aluminum cans. I just don't really see any reason. That would just make it more difficult if it ever needs to be serviced down the road anyways. And these fit on nice and tight. Who would have known the difference? Plus, if you recall, I'm missing a shield for over this tube. Well, it just so happens that this fits perfectly. So I'm just going to cut the end out because I don't want to leave that on because that would just roast that tube. You want to have some ventilation. And I'll clean out some of the uh, remaining tire in there. And I think I got myself a tube shield. Here's how I ended up finishing off that little retrace suppression modification. A 220k resistor makes a pretty firm mount since they shorten up the leads and uh, when the three leads come together I put some heat shrink tubing over that so I don't think it's going to cause any problems. And the final thing I did is install a fuse. Quite easy to do on these sets because there's the AC coming in. One lead goes to the switch, the other one goes straight to the ballast tube. It's a, about a two inch length of wire. Simply snipped it out and stuck in a pigtail fuse. So that's that. One last thing I want to do is with the cabinet. I discovered from previous projects I have two decal sets left. So, I figure I might as well take a stab at touching it up. So here's what I've got. Some traces of the old decals left for uh, volume and contrast and most of the numbers are gone. It's kind of curious that when the numbers wore away they took the toner lacquer with them. So you actually um, Actually, not the toner lacquer, I just took the lacquer out, period, all the way down to the bare wood, basically. So, what I attempt to do is use some uh, probably 320 grit sandpaper and carefully sand off the remains of these decals without taking off any color. And where the finish is already gone, I'm going to try using a little touch up kit I've used before. See if I can find a decent color match. So sort of, um, I wouldn't quite call them watercolor, but they are water-based, sort of water-based stains. And I'll kind of get a fine brush, dab it in there, blend it in, put a little bit of uh, clear lacquer over it, put on decals, and then spray it, uh, I guess, with some semi-gloss. So they don't want to make this too shiny or it won't match the rest of the cabinet. <laughs> 